Sean Smalls filling in for Mixmaster Mike Winters. And joining us in studio this morning from the Walker Aviation Museum, Mr. Robert Sherman. How are you doing this morning? Great, Sean. Good to hear it. Appreciate hear. it. I'm sorry, uh, Mikey, sick, but yeah. uh, you know, that happens. Mixmaster Mike, you know, sometimes he, he falls under the weather. What worries me is is they always call me Mike's doppelganger. And so it really worries me that it's like, I'm basically watching what I'm going to be dealing with in like nine years. It's like, you know, I don't know if I'm ready for this yet. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready to deal with the stresses that are uh, living as Mike Winters. It's, it's, a, it's a hard, it's a hard knock life as they say. Yeah. But, uh, but it's okay. Cause we, uh, we, we pick up and we carry on. Obviously we're uh, kind of coming into <clears throat> coming around the bend of, uh, of the pandemic. I, I know COVID-19 is still, is still a thing, but Things are kind of loosening up. We're, we're we're coming out of our houses. We're, we're you know getting out there. This is going to be the summer that I think people finally you know stretch their legs and, and get out. And I think a lot of tours and a lot of people come into Roswell uh, just to kind of see what uh, you know, what we have to offer. And the Walker Aviation Museum, you guys have, have kept it going pretty much the entire way through. Yeah, it's, we've uh, r- most recently we've kind of started up and we've got three of us uh, that are out there about two to three hours prior to the midday departure mm-hmm. because we just have to depend on volunteers to open it up. Sure. So I usually go out and I've started going out on Saturday now. So we go out Monday through Saturday, about two and a half hours, maybe three uh, prior to the midday takeoff. And you can find that out by just going to aa.com and, you know, punching in ROW for Roswell Dallas, Fort Worth, DFW. Right. And you can see when it is and can, firm that in fact it's flying that day and so if it is we're we're out there trying to we open the doors and Mm -hmm. uh, we get you know anywhere from uh bob dunnell yesterday said they only had five but i think i had uh, 14 on saturday sure and uh it's always kind of a it's a positive experience for me because you normally meet really nice folks and Mm -hmm. you meet veterans you meet other people that are just interested in the history and uh so it's kind of uh Thing that after you know at the end of the day I'm I think it was worth the drive out there to open it up and yeah. do stuff. So we have when we open it up we have uh, a couple of different videos that we can have running that have historical stuff on it and I can go up and we can click on a whole bunch of different things if people are interested in a particular aircraft and they can we have a bunch of, uh, several chairs there that they could just sit there in front of the computer big computer screen and watch. Uh, some of the history of the B-29 or the B-52 or the B-47. or, mm-hmm. And I've got even some other more kind of STEM-type things. Uh, based on my background, I sometimes play the kind of the history and current stuff, what's going on with U-2 or the SR-71 back in the old days mm-hmm. and the pressure suits. and Both awesome bands, by the way, U-2 and SR-71, fantastic bands. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah. Named after the aircraft, obviously, which is funny because I was a huge fan of the band SR-71. It was so hard to find information on the band when I was a kid because I would Google it. I'd never heard of it. A band called SR-71? There is. Yeah, I'll, have to show you, I'll have to show you after we get off the air. But when I was younger, I would Google the band or I would look up the band online and I would come up with pictures of aircrafts. So I actually learned about the SR-71 from, you know, trying to search for, for this band. So I was I was fascinated by it. But one of the things I love about about the, the museum you have out there is is your connection to you know to the STEM world to to science, technology, engineering, and math, and and getting kids involved with with very almost hands on uh, displays and uh, and you know sensory uh, uh, displays like that? It's 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 an awesome setup. Yeah, it's it's great. Uh, Bob Bob Donnell and his wife uh, Peggy are they're great. They they kind of handle the uh, flight simulator stuff that we got from XL Energy Grant. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you to XL Energy for that. And uh, so we have a couple six thousand dollar. Oh, I, well, not, I guess I'm not supposed to say that. But anyway, they're really <laughs> not. They're nice flight simulators, and uh, <clears throat> we have them set up for a 172. And uh, they do a little taxiing, which requires kind of a different thing where you you steer by your feet without touching the the yoke. You know, really? The, yeah. So you by you just go by throttle and uh, <clears throat> your rudder pedals, and uh, so you get to practice taxiing and then we have a takeoff and then let them fly and they fly through these squares and if they all, you know, every time they go through a square, they get a ding, you know, mm-hmm. and if they, they fly through all the squares without missing any and they get this big band playing and kind of nice. celebrates the fact they did a good job. Anyway, I, I feel like I could hold my own once I'm up there. It's the taking off and the landing that really, yeah. really gets me. That's like, that's the, the complicated part of it. 
Yeah. I watch uh, I watch this this lady on on uh, TikTok who who basically every day you can watch her pre flight checklist. It takes like an hour and a half to go through all those pre flight checks just to go up for like fifteen minutes. Ooh, that's there's yeah, a lot. I mean, I under, and understandably because you know you're you're putting your life in the sky. You need to make sure that everything is uh you know up up to speed. And you guys have some really cool uh, cool simulators out there at the uh, museum that allow people to do that. Yeah. Right now the uh, simulators are. Uh, Lockheed software and it's uh, edu stations from uh, STEM uh, Pilot Incorporated. And they're out of Connecticut, but uh, it'll actually fly 50 different aircraft. And if you get a pilot coming in, and go oh 172, big deal, blah blah blah. You can say, well, if you wanted to, you could select an F-35 fighter landed Istanbul, Turkey at nine o'clock at night in the rain. Whoa! And they okay. go, oh, okay, a little more challenging, you know. So. Right. I like that. You can step things up a notch. Oh, sure. Set now, the once difficulty they, level. Once they get up to speed, they can switch over. And I know my uh, <clears throat> sister's uh, son was here visiting from, he lives in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. So he we got him. We, he was flying around New York City <clears throat> telling me about 90% of it was accurate. But he said, no, nope, this right here is not in this location. It's over here, you know, whatever. Right. So, but he had a lot of fun just putting around the area. It's it's about as accurate as we call it, like say Google Maps is. Yeah, it's not always right. gonna not always gonna hit, but uh, but it, it's it, yeah, it, it's at least slightly accurate. I was never big on flight simulators growing up, but I used to play Top Gun on the NES. It is impossible to land that plane on the uh, uh, on the aircraft carrier. I tried for like hours and hours, never could <laughs> never could do it. So uh, it, it's really cool to see how far they've come with with flight simulators and. And the technology behind it, and and that you can you know yeah put input any kind of conditions, any place, and uh, different aircraft. That's that's really yeah. neat. By the way, uh, Walker Air Force Base dot org W A F B mm-hmm. Museum dot org is our website, and uh, <clears throat> we uh, right now uh, our current board members just bring up speed. Of course, myself, uh, Katie Yates is our treasurer and we're looking for a new treasurer because she's going to start teaching full-time but oh, nice. sandy korea uh, bob donnell julie anna halverson who's now one of our city council people judy armstrong jerry cloffer uh, friar Milwaukee, and stephen miller uh, also a new member that's uh, really uh, he's out there almost every day monday through friday is a, a veteran uh, a retired uh, lieutenant colonel from the army ted smith and he has a lot of he's a history crazy buff man he just <laughs> goes crazy on stuff so you can go in there and you can sit there and talk to him for an hour about all kinds of stuff uh he's down right now in san antonio but he'll be back here probably by wednesday or thursday and but so anyway bob donnell myself and ted are out there <clears throat> and uh, welcoming people to come in and mm-hmm. visit and uh i think you know today later in our program i usually do a little history thing sure and I want to maybe dispel some people had the mistaken idea that the, uh, you know, the, the bombers that dropped the atomic bombs in on Japan. Batman and Little Man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, came out of uh, Walker or, you know, the Walker Aviation. Sure. On the Walker Air Force Base, but it wasn't that until later, Roswell Army Airfield. Okay. But uh, kind of clarify that where it actually they came from. Uh, Windover, initial, you know, from the last really? stage of kind of how that set up, and and uh, so they get a little history of the at least the three ninety third flying squadron bomber squadron, and then the uh, uh, some other folks. So that's that's fascinating because because I've I've heard <clears throat> a lot of a lot of you know rumor speculation that yeah that, that those those planes that that carried those bombs flew out of Roswell and there's there's always been like a, a almost misconception but that was kind of that was post war that was post sure post Hiroshima and post Nagasaki they did come back to Roswell so they they came back here yeah they came back okay. here and that's when Roswell Army Airfield and later Walker Air Force Base was the prime premier and at one time but the only atomic bombing base you know in the United States because the uh, B-29s had to be modified to carry the current large, weird, you know, size bombs the that they payload, had then. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. I had no idea. That is so, absolutely fascinating that, that Roswell was, was on the map as the, the premier, or at that point, the only destination for, uh, for, for that fitting. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. So, and then, you know, as everybody knows that when it came down to the Cuban Missile Crisis at that point, 
the Atlas missiles, the 12 Atlas missiles surrounding Roswell had just gone on full status and were ready to go uh, during that particular crisis. So Roswell was kind of a key target if we were to get into a war right. of being the premier atomic bomb base besides being surrounded by um, Atlas missiles. Yeah, that's, abs- that's, that's amazing. I mean, y- y- you look at Roswell now and you think, well, there's, you know, we've calmed down quite a little bit, but, uh, but the history behind, uh, behind the Walker uh, Air Force Base is absolutely f- you know, fascinating. And, and one of the, uh, my favorite things to do is actually jump on the uh, Remembering Roswell Facebook page because you can really be treated to just a, a, a history lesson of, of what you know, Roswell was like back then, back, you know, being a, a military town, essentially, that was a lot more fitted, you know, basically with, with, with you know, stuff for, for the community. Yeah. That, that sort of things have, 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 you know, deteriorated over the last few decades. But when we were a military town, we were absolutely booming. And it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um. You know, we've uh, elected, because we don't have enough people, we just barely have enough people to keep it open, we're not really going to be running a golf tournament. And what we're probably going to do is just go around to some of the companies that have helped us in the past and just ask for some, you know, sure. uh, support. And then in the past, uh, some of our key people that have helped us keep our doors open and function is, of course, XL Energy, uh, Roswell Toyota, Pioneer Bank, um, AirSail was a big player. Mm-hmm. Glenn's Furniture's helped us out Absolutely. some, and uh, Featherstone Development Corp, and a few other docs like Dr. Paul Ingstrom and Phil Cathy, and other other individuals scattered around town. We really appreciate their support. Absolutely. Now, I also understand you guys are, and this is a constant, consistent thing, is we're always looking to, to grow the board. We're always looking to... to yes, for, absolutely. For, we need people. For, for folks that, that have an interest in, uh, in aviation, in history, in, you know... Learning more and also, you know, helping others kind of open the doors to learn more. Yeah, if everybody could see me on TV or go, actually you could go on the computer and watch me, you could say, man, yeah, I understand. Uh, well, Bob Sherman, he's kind of getting up there. I'm a Roswell High class of 61 graduate. So Is that right? I'm coming up on the big eight zero number. But, um, yeah, we definitely need some new younger blood in there so that when people like myself, and I know Bob has been really, Bob Donnell's really helped out and, all other members of the board have been very helpful, but we're going to really definitely need some new blood to kind of keep things going. Mm-hmm. And uh, by the way, uh, for those that are on the computer, you can, I have a newsletter here I'm holding in front of the camera. And this is beautiful, by the way. We're but, very well uh, put together. We got that. Now it's been put on the uh, website, so you can go on the website and, and read the, the newsletter. So um, this kind of gives you an up to speed, a few things going on. Thanks. This is thanks, of course, to Juliana Halverson. She's, she's our technical wizard yeah, to put this stuff together. She's, she's a, a phenomenal at, at, uh, at putting stuff like this together. Uh, one of the things that I love about uh, the Walker Aviation Museum is it, it, well, its location inside the airport in that when people fly into Roswell, they, they come here for a reason. We're really not a layover town or a layover city. So when people come to, to you know, the Roswell Airport, they're coming here <coughs> to come to Roswell. They're coming here to learn about Roswell. And it gives you a great opportunity that while you're you know, passing through the airport – to, before you get to the aliens, before you get to the you know the UFOs and all the you know the speculation mm-hmm. and stuff, you get to dive into the actual history of really a place that that you know world military you know organization could not have happened without the Walker Aviation or without the Walker Air Force Base. Right, and and it's it's a fascinating dive into history. And uh, you know, if you come into the lobby, there's where you can grab a snack there where you're waiting for your airplane to take off. Uh, there's a big, uh, I guess what, ten feet wingspan, big model of a B-29 hanging over you. Really? And in the paper, they mentioned they were going to remove that model, and actually, what they meant to say was the painting on the wall was removed to put the sign, some, okay. some stuff up. I talked to Scott Stark about that, and he said no, that they don't have any plans on removing that model, so that model's going to be there. I was kind of concerned because that's kind of a key thing. It's right outside of our museum, and it's you know, the B-29 was really tied into Roswell in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And the history that it has, uh, unfortunate that we had to use the atomic weapon, but, you know, things are the way they are. And uh, I thought before we get into some other <clears throat> history right quick, I would mention, you know, like, uh, Sean, you mentioned we have that STEM item. Besides coming yes. out and doing the flight simulator, we try to get groups of eight and the reason for that is we got two simulators. That way, when we break people up for an hour, mm-hmm. 
to fly the flight simulator, we got two on a simulator versus three or four, and that's right. gets kind of out of hand. So, uh, for example, we've got the New Mexico Youth Challenge coming out on Friday, eight, okay. and then the, the following week, another group of eight are coming out for the New Mexico Youth Challenge. And we're going to try to get, of course, uh, Roswell Independent School District. We look for getting 14 to 18-year-olds out there. Okay, so and, we're talking like like <clears throat> high schoolers. High school. Yeah, high schoolers. Sure. Or middle school. Sure. Yeah. And that's, and that's a great time to kind of spark that interest in in aviation, in, in the history behind uh, the Walker Aviation Museum, and, and to kind of have that chance to, to kind of dive into that. That's yeah, and the other side of that is while those are doing the flight simulator, the other group, is, as I've mentioned before in this program, uh, are seeing uh, now, they're seeing 15 different uh, YouTube videos on various STEM careers, STEM being science, technology, engineering, and math. Sure. And uh, we don't go to the STEAM yet. We're just sticking with the STEM right now. But Well, if the others handle the arts. <clears throat> oh, sure. We're all about but, the techniques. So we sit down, and it's anywhere from like a minute and a half to three or four minutes long. We mm -hmm. see science, technology, and math overview, careers in aviation, New Mexico, Eastern Mexico University of Roswell Aviation Maintenance Technician Program, mm -hmm. a day in the life of a wind turbine engineer. Mm. Crumlin Auto Group and Eastern New Mexico University Roswell Auto Mechanic Program. Uh, oil well worker career. What it, what does a registered nurse do? Architectural engineering versus architecture. What's the difference? And now we're running five uh, really short but really interesting U.S. Air Force uh, recruiting videos on technical training overview, aerospace ground equipment, air traffic control, electronic principles, and geospatial intelligence. Okay. And the last one we show is Day in the Life at CIA. Really? Yeah. Okay. And the reason I got that I, idea— I thought that you couldn't confirm or deny that you have spent well, a day in life at CIA. Well, if you watch CIA. that, then there— <laughs> uh, I take science news and some other science magazines, and on the back recently of the science news magazine that comes, there's a full page on the whole back cover— on all the technical science jobs you can get at the CIA. Really? So the CIA is advertising on magazines and stuff. But That's awesome. It's pretty cool. I'd love to go so work for the CIA. So what we're trying to do is open kids' eyes saying, man, I never thought about doing that for a living. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. I've never once in my entire life been called intelligence. So to think I work for an intelligence <laughs> agency, right. that's awesome. I just signed me up. I'm in. And that's great, too, because it's it's. You know, it's, it's giving a, a, the next generation, the kids that are coming up, some ideas. You don't have to necessarily be dead set on, I'm going to be this when I grow up. You can come in wondering and, and be open to all sorts of different career opportunities. And this is, this is a great chance to kind of dip a toe into, into a lot of different uh, careers. Yeah. Steve Griffin <clears throat> is a retired uh, Navy guy, but he was a professional weatherman the whole time. And he's put in a lot of his equipment. We've got it now labeled, it's hanging on the wall there. And you also come in and people can touch the touch screen. Just similar. We worked with the UFO museum when they updated their stuff with the Walker mm -hmm. stuff when you go in there. So you can touch and get a two, two minute history of Walker air force base, or you can get a two minute history of the Atlas missile, Atlas F missile. That's, that's very cool. So, so we're, that's still there along with the other videos that we have running. So yeah, and that's, that's one <clears> thing <throat> that I, I admire about the, uh, the Walker aviation museum is the, you know, adherence to the, to the new tech, to the touch screens, to the STEM, uh, you know, uh, installations, you guys have kind of your fingers in a lot of different pies, and, and you're, you're, you're keeping uh, kids and uh, th this next generation interested and active in uh, learning about, you know, the history of, of uh, the Walker Air Force Base. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely great. Uh, real quick before we dive into the history lesson, um, <coughs> I did want to talk about the, uh, the Amazon Smile uh, affiliate program. Oh, yes, right. Because of that is that's one way that that uh, if you're you know thinking I want to help out walk, the Walker Aviation Museum uh, what they're doing and their their mission, uh, you just don't know how. Well, if you're shopping on Amazon, they've got a smile link. It's it's super simple and super easy to use. That's right. Yeah, you just you head over to uh, I believe it's <clears throat> you head over to the Walker Aviation Museum website, which is wafbmuseum.org. There's a link on the website, right. and that'll link you to Amazon. You just do your shopping through there, and a portion of the proceeds go directly back to the Walker Aviation Museum. Right. That's right. And that's, that's right. what I try to make sure I do because I get a few, you know, a few books and oh, stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I uh, exclusively buy my paper towels and toilet paper on, uh, on Amazon. So <laughs> I, I do what I can. Too much information. Okay. You know, I, I go Viva and Angel Soft. <laughs> That's too much information. <laughs> so, so let's dive into uh, into a little history because I, you, you kind of you kind of gave us a little taste a second yeah. ago. But I'm I'm fascinated by this because I've I've 
I didn't. I wasn't born in Roswell, but I'm as close to a native son as you could be. I spent a lot of time here, and I've heard a lot of those stories that you know Roswell was the was the center point for for all of you know all of the goings on with with Fat Man, and Little Man, and that that New Mexico and, and and you know of all the things that happened with Los Alamos and, and <clears> down <throat> in, in Alamogordo, that we were the place that it launched from. So 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 let's let's dive in. Okay, uh, Windover Field or Windover Air Force Base. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, a lot of people mistakenly think the Enola Gay that dropped the time bomb Hiroshima in a boxcar, right. which dropped in Nagasaki, which was an alternate target, mm-hmm. came from Roswell Army Airfield and later Walker Air Force Base. The right. history of the bombers and the 393rd Bomb Squadron 509th Composite Group were all very important parts of the, the Walker Air Force Base after the war. And it's tied closely, but it's tied, uh, tied very closely to Wendover. And this is why. Wendover... Army Airfield's history began in 1940 when the United States Army began looking for additional bombing ranges. Area near the town of Wendover, big population of 100 people Ooh, wow. at that time in 1940, <laughs> was well suited for the needs because it was virtually uninhabited. Uh, only people that got upset were the ranchers when they took a large section of that. Sure. Um, had excellent flying weather. It was the nearest largest city was Salt Lake City, about 100 miles to the east. It's right on the border, the western border of... Uh, uh, Utah. Okay. Okay. The population, okay. Uh, though isolated, it served by the Western Pacific Railroad, so they could get, you know, material in there pretty mm-hmm. easy. Construction on the base began in September 1940 and the bombing range in November 1940. The base and associated g- bombing ranges, get this, was 1,822,000 acres. Wow. It was uh, an, uh, the base. So a and little the, bit of space. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the base, the bombing range, and the the gunnery range and all that stuff was 86 miles long and in between 18 and 36 miles wide, running up and down that 86 miles. Mm. So you can kind of imagine what that'd be like from here down to Artesia Vaughan. all the way to Rio Doso. You sure. Know what I mean? like, so the it's ranchers complained land. about being overridden by the governor and the War Department. Uh, so they said, no, we're going to put that here. So the United States entered World War II. Wendover Field took on the great importance, and it was uh, a really large bombing range, so... The new base uh, was supplied and serviced by the Ogden Air Depot out of Hill Field, like Hill Air Force Base in the mm-hmm. future. By late 1943, there were 2,000 civilian employees at Wendover, 17,500 military personnel at Wendover, and construction of, had started and they'd built already three 8,100-foot uh, runways, 300,000-foot, 300,000-square-foot ramp, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And by May 1945, the base had 668 buildings on it, 300-bed hospital, gymnasium, swimming pool, 361 housing units. You get the idea. It was yeah. a big base. Um, training of B-17 Flying Fortress and B-24 Liberator groups began in April 42, using this bombing area. So between 42 and 44, uh, Wendover hosted 20 newly formed uh, B-17 or B-24 bombing groups. Okay, now, um, in June 43, preparation began for the operational use <clears throat> of atomic bombs. Right. <clears throat> the best plane, I didn't know this, the best plane to use to carry and drop the atomic bomb at that time was the British Lancaster. Oh, okay. Because it had a 33-foot bomb bay, huge bomb bay. Sure. So, but uh, Major General uh, Groves, the director of the Manhattan Project and General Hap Arnold, the uh, chief of the United States Army Air Forces, wanted to use an American airplane. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the B-29 Super Fortress was chosen, even though it required substantial modification. And you probably have heard of that. The modifications of those aircraft became known as the silver plate. Mm-hmm. There was, oh, that's okay. They, that's so, what that is. <clears throat> I yeah. have heard, I've heard the terminology. I did not know that's, that's what that was referencing. Okay. The modification project. <clears throat> was That's called the uh, pardon me silver plate, and uh, the code name eventually became identified with the training and operational aspects of the program as well. Mm-hmm. Um, then uh, Hap Arnold selected uh, Colonel Paul Tibbetts, an officer with distinguished combat record uh, in Europe and North Africa, to, uh, and was an expert in the B twenty nine. So Tib- Tibbetts came to Windover, and he started training uh, with his guys there, and uh, uh, but. It was also a reasonable distance by air from the Manhattan Project site Y at Los Alamos and uh, also another site in the Salton Sea, which is on the southern tip of 
California inland a little bit. There's a salt sea down there. I had to look that up on the, oh, wow. on a Google. Just did a Google thing on the, uh, air station salt and sea and see where that was. Mm-hmm. But uh, the base was given the code name Kingman and became the Manhattan Project site, uh, site K, as in Kilo, K. And uh, the activity to assemble, modify, and flight test prototype bombs was named Project W-47, of all hmm. things. And 14 September 44, the 393rd, that's, that's the ones that was at, at uh, Walker. Right. 393rd Bomb Squadron arrived at Windover from its former base in Fairmont Army Air Base, Nebraska, where it had been an operational training unit. The 509th Composite Group was created in 17 December 1944, which the 393rd Bomb Squadron became a part. 800 people were signed off and on of different specialties to the 509th. And the Manhattan Project, the first technical detachment was attached to the 509th. And um, the 2, 216th Army Air Forces Base Units, bracket special, constructed prototype atomic weapons without nuclear material, of course, and drop tested them. In February 1945, a flight test section was created within the 216th Army Air Force Bases Unit to carry out testing of prototype bombs in the shape of Little Boy and Fat Man bombs. And uh, the 393rd Bomb Squadron, led by Paul Tibbetts, had his air crew flying practice drops of these bombs, plus 50 practice drops of inert, what they call pumpkin bombs, before he declared his group combat ready. At that time, they all jumped on either airplanes or ships, and they headed out for Tinian. And the rest of us kind of history uh, huh. conducted the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs on, right. on the 6th and 9th of August, 1945. And they returned to Roswell, the 509th Composite, and the 393rd returned to Roswell on Walker Air Force Base. Uh, and today, Wendover is a civilian airport. So that's kind of where all that came from. So this was certainly not part of the punny <clears throat> fly-by-night uh, operation. They they definitely uh, I, a lot of planning, a lot of a lot oh, of yes. uh, uh, you know training went into uh, making sure that everything was. And uh, I, I shortened my because oh, it goes sure. on paragraph after paragraph if you sure read about that of all the training and special uh, modifications and stuff they did getting ready to go over to Tinian. And essentially, they they put Windover on the map. They, they became, like, the, the town of, of Wendover is there because of this military operation. That's right. That's absolutely fascinating. Oh, a big town of 100 people to begin with. <laughs> Sweet Enola Gay, as they say. Yeah. That's, uh, that's absolutely fascinating. Well, that's, that's awesome. And this is just kind of a sample of some of the, the history that you can get by visiting the Walker Aviation Museum. There's there's a ton of uh, amazing stories and uh, amazing, uh, you know, inf- information you can get out there. One of the things I noticed, uh, I was actually driving back into town uh, the other day. It fascinates me that I can see that I don't know if there's like a name for it, but I can see the airplane graveyard before I can actually see the water towers here in Roswell. Like I can see all the the, the different planes that we have along the, uh, you know, along our, our, our tarmac before I actually caught uh, the water towers. That's how significant they are to me that we have so, so many just decommissioned planes and, and, and you know, planes that are out there for parts or, or planes that are being worked on. It's it it's always something new to see out there. Now, a lot of those planes, Sean, are are you know they're just being stored, right? Yeah, because they're active. Uh, you know, like when the six what was it six thirty seven Max uh, had their accidents, mm-hmm. and Boeing, you know, they had to ground all those airplanes. Right. At one time, we had over five hundred active airplanes that were good, but were just sitting here and uh, paying rent to the city of Roswell just to stay here. And with the COVID, you know, slowdown and stuff. Right. So uh, I think we're down to a little less than 300 now. I'm not sure, but uh, Scott Stark could tell you all that. But, yeah, you're right. A lot of those are decommissioned that they're kind of taken apart and using parts on. But mm-hmm. some of them are still, of course, just good. Sure. And people fly in. It's like, man, this is a huge airport, you know, except the building's really little. Yeah, and I said, well, those planes are just in storage. You're not actually, you know, flying on a day-to-day basis. Right? But, but it does make us – it gives us a nice footprint oh, on, yeah. on Google Earth. Because it shows you how big Walker was, the mm-hmm. big runways. And, and we all know that we see airliners come in. They come in to use these – because the traffic is not high. Right. So they can come in and do touch-and-goes, and the Navy can come in with their fighters, and the guys can practice landing mm-hmm. and takeoffs and stuff. So yeah. that's kind of a nice thing. We – if you're – like I am a 30-year Air Force veteran. My wife even 
when she hears a fighter jet going overhead, she thinks, wow, that's great. Sound of freedom. Because mm-hmm. she's absolutely. used to that being on bases where it was just nothing but flying, flying overhead oh, sure. all the time. Oh, sure. Absolutely. So, it, you know, this is just a, a great uh, a great organization out there. The Walker Aviation Museum, we want to, of course, uh, encourage anybody who uh, wants to donate time or, uh, of course, funds uh, to the museum. They can absolutely use either one of those things. But uh, if you're, you know, flying out or even if you just have, a, you know, a few minutes around lunchtime or whatever, pop into the, the museum and, and give yourself a little history lesson. It's it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, if, if folks want more information about the museum, about uh, what you guys are doing, where can they find you? Well, you just go to the you know, website, mm-hmm. wfbmuseum.org. Dot .org. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, again, you know, come on in and we just love to talk to you. We've had people... Uh, Give us, we don't have much room for stuff, but we are still getting information and stuff. We got a really nice, uh, back in the old days, 1940 uh, uniform from some folks. And uh, we've been doing a little flag flying. We had a couple people send us flags that, you know, my father was stationed there and, Mm -hmm. or my grandfather was, would you fly the flag? And we fly the flag and Juliana takes a few pictures and we send them back the video and stuff. So we've done that a couple of times. That's very cool. Very cool. So yeah, um, wafbmuseum.org. Uh, if you want more information, you can also find the uh, the link to the Smile uh, affiliate account there, uh, and uh, that'll be a great way you can uh, contribute. You know, some extra funds uh, to the museum. Right. Uh, yeah. Right now, uh, Monday through Saturday, the planes. I think the schedule has changed. Uh, there's a takeoff around. I think a little bit after ten in the okay. morning. So we're opening up about 7.45 to 8. So basically when there's a flight going out, the museum is essentially yeah. open. And when the flight was leaving at 1 o'clock, we were opening up about 10.30 or 11. Okay. And staying open for a couple hours, maybe a half an hour past the takeoff time. Sure. So so plenty of opportunity. And again, if you want more information, uh, Walker, uh, wafbmuseum.org. Um, or is there a, a phone number that folks can call if they want to see if maybe you guys are open at the moment? I think that's on the website. Just, just go to the website and they'll yep. have all the info. Perfect. Right. Very right. good. Well, Robert, thank you so much for your time. appreciate it, Sean. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, again, folks, uh, contribute to the Walker Aviation Museum because it's such a fascinating history. And every time I talk to Robert, I learn something new about Roswell. And I've been here for you know more than 20 years. There's always something new to learn around here. So you know, talk to Robert. Talk to, to the folks that, uh, that know because that's really where you find out uh, the fascinating info. Once again, Robert, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it, Sean. Appreciate you.